seeing, you know, your backyard or the city that you live in from above is still really enticing. And that's enticing to kind of a universal audience. I don't see that changing because the content creators are constantly pushing the limits with what type of media they're creating. And then there's always going to be something unique found when you view it from above. You're listening to the Drone Radio Show podcast, the show about drones and the people who use them for business, fun and research. Hosted by Randy Goers. Hello, everyone. This is Randy Goers, and welcome to the Drone Radio Show podcast, episode 140. What's it take to create a really compelling drone video? For that question, we turn to two people that spend most of their day watching and ranking drone videos submitted by people from all over the world. Megan Gaffney is Vice President of Marketing, and Tyler Mason is Director of Digital Media, both of Airviews. Airviews was launched in late 2015 as a video sharing platform for the worldwide drone community. Featuring a blend of user-generated content and original programming, Airviews has become the premier online video site for the emerging drone age. In this edition of the Drone Radio Show, Megan and Tyler talk about the factors that can boost a video's likability and push it to the top of the charts. Anyone wanting to take their drone videos to the next level will be interested in hearing what Tyler and Megan have to share. Now, before we hear from Megan and Tyler, I want to thank those of you who have been supporting my funding campaign on Patreon. For as little as $1 per month, you can help defray the costs of production and keep the podcast going and growing. Go to patreon.com slash drone radio show to join the team. Now let's learn how we can produce great drone videos with Megan Gaffney and Tyler Mason. Let's pick up the interview where I asked them to introduce themselves. My name is Tyler Mason. I'm the director of digital media at Airviews. I do a little bit of everything for uh, all of the departments here, I mainly work in marketing. I also do some social media, and then I am a certified drone pilot, so I fly for some of the events that we do and get some footage. And then I also host a show called The Drone Dish on Airviews. Uh, where I interview drone pilots from around the world and talk to them about how they got into drones, uh, some of the work that they've done, the equipment they use. Just kind of go in depth a little bit with them as well. So do a little bit of everything here, which makes for not a boring day here. My name is Megan Gaffney, and I'm the Vice President of Marketing at Airviews. And much like it sounds, I head up and coordinate everything that we do with marketing, which deals with primarily with our social media, but also some traditional advertising and working through our editorial calendar. Do either of you fly drones? I do. I've been flying for actually close to two and a half years now. Started in August 2015. Started with the Blade Chroma, which is no longer in existence. I uh, worked my way up to the Phantom 4, which is what I fly now. And I occasionally will fly the Inspire 2. Passed my Part 107 test in February of last year, and um, that's about it. I also fly, and I'm a certified pilot, but I don't fly as often as I'd like to. I admittedly watch many more drone videos than I create. Were you both flying before you joined Airviews, or did that come afterwards? Yeah, I started flying before. I'd been flying for two or three months before I was brought on to Airviews. So kind of had my first introduction to drones and transitioned that into Airviews, turned it into a job with the company. I started flying after working at Airviews. I've worked in a wide variety of industries, and this is the first that's had anything to do with tech or drones. So Tyler, were you a user of the site before you joined Airviews? Did you upload any videos? I did, yeah. I heard of the site kind of early on, I guess, in its beginning and, and thought it was a pretty cool idea. And so I put my videos up there, which, you know, looking back two plus years later, my early videos were not the greatest. They're certainly growing quite a bit, I think, as a pilot and an editor. So it's always interesting to watch. But yeah, I, I uh, was uploading quite a bit before uh, I started here. How old is the company? Just over two years. Megan, can you talk about how it's grown in those two years? Yeah, the first year at Airviews, the community was admittedly pretty small. It was about building that core community, working through the kind of technical challenges with making a global media hosting site. And then the second year really marked our year of growth where we were actively out searching for content creators and then making sure that we were doing our job to make those content creators happy by getting eyeballs on the site. Do you have any numbers that you can share? Yeah, we're over a quarter of a million registered users and surpassed 50,000 aerial videos. 
And to give kind of some perspective to that, for registered users over the last year, it's like a 5,000% growth. And videos were over 300% growth in the past 12 months. So we're seeing that nice bell curve that you kind of hope for where we feel like we're on the start of, you know, massive trajectory for this really, really large global community. And we're very hopeful that that's what it becomes. What does your research tell you about why AirViews has become so popular? Some of our pickup that we have on social media tells a lot about why the site is so successful. You know, we reach over 10 million people a month on social media, and the content is shared in tens of thousands per post. And then the really viral ones, it's like even more than that, you know, a million views per post. And aerial content still has some widespread appeal to the masses. There's such a variety of content and even seeing, you know, your backyard or the city that you live in from above is still really enticing. And that's enticing to kind of a universal audience. I don't see that changing because the content creators are constantly pushing the limits with what type of media they're creating. And then there's always going to be something unique found when you view it from above. Who uses your site? Is there a general profile of the average user? Unfortunately, as a marketer, This makes my job a lot more difficult, but it's a total variety of people from every country around the world. We don't have and we have a hard time pinpointing kind of common threads between our audience. But I think that speaks to why the site is so successful with 23 different categories of aerial content. You can kind of find the type of aerial media that you're looking to consume, whether it has people or sports or it's travel related, or you're just looking for something really unique that you haven't consumed before, there's kind of something for everybody. Now, you both watch a lot of videos. So in your opinion, what makes for a really great, compelling video on AirViews? One that gets noticed and shared. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a pretty common question. I think a lot of people are, are curious how their video can get more views or you know how to kind of gain traction. One of the big things that I always tell people is really paying attention to the first maybe five to 10 seconds of your video. Here at Airviews, we're watching tons of videos daily. And if there's a video that's got a really powerful opening or something really unique in the first couple seconds, you know, that grabs you in as a viewer. So, you know, a lot of people tend to maybe put their logo at the beginning of the video um, or their name or a title of the video. That just kind of takes away from you know, the excitement level and maybe doesn't grab the viewer uh, right away. So that's a big one that I like to, you know, kind of point out to people. There's other things too. I think music is a big one. You pick a bad song, it can kind of ruin a video. So that's, as a pilot myself and a content creator myself, that's something that I always struggle with is kind of finding the right song. So I'll almost spend more time searching through music than going through my footage just because, you know, I'll usually know what kind of shots I want, but I might not know what song I want. You know, obviously with that too, you have to pay attention to copyright issues because there's a lot of websites and, and social media that'll flag any copyrighted music. So that's a big one too. One thing that we've kind of seen a trend of as well, just in terms of, you know, what people are interested in is videos with other people in them or with the pilot taking a droney, for example. I think just seeing another person kind of gets you interested. And if it's a droney, it kind of adds perspective to you know, wherever it is that you're flying. Maybe it's in the mountains and it kind of just shows you the scale of it, for example. So, you know, if you see a person right away in a video, I think it's going to make it more interesting. Is there an ideal length for a video? I don't know if there's a, an ideal length. I think it kind of depends on the flow of the video. I mean, if it's really great content and it, and it moves, you know, maybe it's even telling a story of some sort. You know, we've seen videos up to 10 minutes or so that, you know, I still want to watch the whole thing because it's compelling. But I would say on average, anywhere from probably a minute. Um, I know a lot of people cut their videos for a minute because that's what Instagram allows, for example. But yeah, anywhere from a minute to three, maybe four minutes is kind of the, the range. Like I said, it all depends if it's kind of dragging along and it's a three, four minute video it can feel really long. If it's a minute, maybe it's too short. So it's, it, there's kind of a sweet spot and it really depends on the, the footage and the music and you know what it is that the video is about. But um, on average, I would say most are probably within two to three minutes. Do you see any trends related to the hardware choices? Based on how far the cameras on the drones have come, I mean, you, you absolutely see a difference if someone is shooting on you know, maybe an outdated camera system or, you know, they export the video in a low resolution or whatever the case may be compared to someone who's shooting in 4K raw, just a really, really sharp image. Um, We've even seen some 5K videos. One of my favorite videos on our site was shot in 5K and it's just stunning. It almost looks fake because it's so, the the picture quality is so good. But 
Um, I think we're seeing, you know, most people are, are shooting in 4K or at least 1080, and, and that certainly makes a difference. What makes a compelling shot? I mean, what really grabs your attention that makes you go, wow? There's a lot of different things that I gravitate towards. I love the, the top-down perspective is what I call it. Um, some people have different names, but just when that camera's pointed straight down, it, it just adds that element of a drone that you can't get from you know another camera. I also really love shots that maybe it's a reveal of some sort or it kind of flies past whether it's a building or a statue or a tree in reverse. And those are always things that I gravitate towards. But I, I think, too, that uh, you know, low elevation stuff is, is kind of overlooked. Uh, you know, most people think because it's a drone, you have to fly it three, four hundred feet in the air to get the shots of me. But some of the stuff that I'm intrigued by is, is how people are using them at lower altitudes, maybe even, you know, five, ten feet off the ground to, to really kind of get those close shots of a person or a car or whatever the case may be. So I think that's something that people should keep in mind is that your shot doesn't have to be 400 feet in the air. It can be four feet in the air because... And the important thing about the drone is you get that smooth shot, regardless of you know whether you're four feet or 400 feet. And those are a couple of elements that I enjoy. Um, uh, Megan, you maybe have uh, some other things that you want to add? No, I was going to second the top-down shot is probably my favorite because you can still, you can take such what may seem like mundane or normal landscapes or locations or a city that maybe you are super familiar with, and then you turn it top-down and you start picking a pattern and texture or or the whole thing flattens. So it's kind of like the quintessential drone shot. And I hope that it doesn't go away because that is part of what makes this craft so exciting. In photography, experts talk about the golden hour, that time just before and just after sunset and sunrise, when it's the most ideal time to take images. Is there a similar rule when shooting aerial videos? Yeah, I mean, I think you always want to be cognizant of, you know, where the sun is. Uh, you know, if it's high noon, uh, you're going to potentially get some glare off of the water or anything like that. But, you know, I, I agree with, with the golden hour thing. I mean, I absolutely love golden hour. I'm kind of a sucker for sunsets as well. Kind of cliched and overdone, but I always enjoy a good sunset video or picture. I think it's something to certainly think about, you know, what time of day you're shooting. I would guess the average drone pilot maybe doesn't use any type of ND filters or uh, you know that type of thing on a drone. So yeah, that can really make a big difference with your footage if you're using a filter in a, on a bright, sunny day, especially depending on your location. You know, I mentioned water if you're over a lake or the ocean. That can really help reduce that glare and just add a little bit to it as well. So you know, I don't think there's a bad time of day to shoot. You see a lot of good nighttime footage as well. So really any time of day, just as long as you're kind of being aware of your camera settings as they correlate to you know, where the sun is, where the shadows are, and all that type of stuff. Piloting a drone and shooting great video are two of the key skills that someone needs to master. The third, and oftentimes overlooked, is the editing and post-production phase. Can you talk about that phase and its importance in the overall scheme of creating a great video? That's still something that I'm, I'm trying to learn uh, every time I edit a video. You know, I I came into the drone piloting world with very little video editing experience. I'd done a little bit um, in college and a couple classes, but I mean, it didn't really have a, a really good background on that. So I've been kind of learning as I go. And, you know, there's a lot of effects and, and different things you can do out there that I've still not tried. But part of what I like about watching videos is kind of getting some ideas for different types of edits that I could do on my next shot, whether it's a, a transition or just any type of you know effect that you can do in the editing process. Because you're right that... You know, regardless of how good your footage is, uh, you know, it's really only as good as your edit. I guess I would encourage drone pilots out there who maybe don't have a strong editing background to find some videos uh, or tutorials online of uh, whether it's Adobe Premiere or Final Cut Pro or even Apple iMovie, just to kind of get your feet wet and get experience because that makes a huge difference in the final product. My assumption is that people kind of forget when they purchase a drone that you'll spend more time editing your video than you will flying and capturing footage. And that craft, that craft of editing and that technical skill is just as important to make really phenomenal videos. So like Tyler said, it doesn't have to be that you're using Premiere or After Effects or these, you know, super complex editing software tools. But you should know going into this that if you really want to make a great video, you're going to have to have a pretty good knowledge of how to put that footage together. I think that underscores the point that for some people... They're going to need to keep an open mind as it may require learning new skills other than just flying a drone. Tyler, maybe you can share your personal experience of how this plays out. Yeah, I think patience is probably an important tool to have as well. 
it can be frustrating at times, both, you know, the piloting part of it in, in terms of learning, you know, how to fly. You know, I'm still learning things every time I fly. But yeah, just, I mean, go into everything about it with an open mind and, you know, it, it is a learning process and you're not going to learn overnight how to, you know, edit the, the most amazing drone video. You're not going to learn overnight how to become the best drone pilot. So, you know, in terms of the piloting part, it's just spending a lot of time, you know, at the controls and, and getting a bunch of flight hours in and, you know, really the same goes for editing too. You know, the more you do it, the more comfortable you get, maybe even develop kind of your own editing style or piloting style. I would just say consume, you know, a bunch of content as well and, and get inspired because you know, when I see videos on Airviews or, or elsewhere, you know, I, I get inspired by just the, the amount of creativity that's out there and some of the things that other pilots are doing you know, blows my mind sometimes. So it kind of raises the bar and makes you want to up your game. And don't get discouraged. I think every one of the pilots at our office has come back from a shoot or a place that they thought was going to be the most incredible footage they've ever shot. And then they find themselves at one point or another, you know, kind of disappointed with how it turned out. And that just speaks to the kind of multi-level skill set that's required to create a good drone video. But don't give up. And we have seen outliers to that where people upload the first video they took with their brand new Mavic Pro, for example, and were completely blown away with it. What type of videos are you receiving these days? Any trends in the subject matter or character of the videos? Yeah, I would say we're getting you know, a lot of travel type videos. And I think, you know, that's probably a byproduct of maybe just drones are becoming easier to travel with. You know, that we mentioned the Mavic before. That's a kind of a perfect traveler's tool, traveler's drone to just put in a backpack and bring wherever. So we're getting a lot of videos of people that are you know, out exploring and um, whether it's just a straight up drone video or the vlog style video is becoming more popular. And then I also, I think we're seeing a little bit more of, uh, as I mentioned before, videos with people in them, whether it's droney or you know, someone filming uh, their family or friends or someone doing a sport or any type of that. So those are the couple of trends that I've noticed over the last probably year or so. And I think that 2018 is going to be the year of cinematic FPV videos. The cameras that FPV pilots are putting onto their drones and the stabilization tools that they're using, either while they're flying or in post-production, are creating what look like big blockbuster Hollywood high-speed flights through all sorts of places. But what we've seen most frequently kind of over the last few months from the top level of FPV pilots are through kind of landscapes or mountains or trees, kind of nature scene. So I think that's really going to expand over the next year and more and more FPV pilots on kind of all skill levels are going to start incorporating that cinematic style of flying into their videos. People may not know this, but Airviews curates all of the videos. How do you decide which videos rise to the top when you have so many videos submitted each month? Sure. So we curate 100% of the videos. Everything that uploads gets put through what we like to refer to as a human machine. So we watch a lot of drone videos on a daily basis. Our entire team is kind of sharing that burden's the wrong word because it's one of the best perks of our job. We truly watch a lot of drone videos. And really, it's a way to help the actual computer and machine that runs the system do better because we're still 100% or mostly we have some original programming, but anything that's uploaded by a creator, they're free to write whatever sort of description or content within below the video that they want to. Sometimes that means that they might leave out some terms that are important to search where we're able to then go in, complete that information at some point, computers might be smart enough to tell what's in a video, but we're not at that point yet. So we're making sure that when a user comes to the site and, say, searches for drone video of the Philippines, that those videos are coming up. And then also adding into that curation, a ranking around how well, like a multitude of factors, how good that drone video is. So that the kind of the best of the best on a trending and rotational basis is floating to the top of the queue for new visitors, because we are still in a position where most of the visitors to the site are new visitors. When you describe how that process works, it really goes to the point to make sure your videos grab the attention of the viewers as quick as possible. And I think that's why that kind of first three to five seconds is so important to, and maybe one of the first pieces of advice that anyone at Airviews would give you is because we are at a level of watching a lot of aerial content. And I think this is true of anyone in the internet age, that our consumption of video is so high right now that if you're not paying attention to that opening, 
you're going to lose people. So tell us about the Airviews Video Awards. This year, we're excited to launch the Airviews Drone Video Awards. They're the first awards that will be 100% voted on by content creators. So we wanted to find a way to really reward the great content that we've gotten throughout the past year, but also allow our content creators to kind of build this community amongst each other and help celebrate the best of the best. So we closed submissions on December 15th, and we had over 33,000 videos submitted between January 1st and December 15th. We kind of relied on our curation and computer algorithm in conjunction with everyone here in the office. We had a really fun, long and kind of arduous afternoon last week where we poured over and kind of everyone fought for their best of the best and narrowed down 13 categories to five nominees. Beginning Monday, the nominees will be announced, and then anyone who's uploaded any sort of aerial photo or aerial video to airviews.com will be granted access to a portal where they can vote on each of the categories. From those categories, drone video of the year and FPV video of the year will be chosen. And this is the first time that Airviews is presenting the awards? Yeah, this is the first time we've decided to do some sort of award or kind of rundown of what the best of the best is from the past year. And it really speaks to the volume of content that we got uploaded in the past 12 months. I don't think we would have been in a place with market share or content creator awareness to do this in 2016. So it it really felt right to find a way to highlight and give recognition and also a cash reward to the people who are creating top aerial content. What kind of prizes will the winners receive? The two top prizes, Drone Video of the Year and FPV Video of the Year, will each receive $1,000. The other categories will receive cash prizes and some other goodies that will be announced on Monday. When will the winners be announced? The winners will be announced on Facebook Live on Monday, February 5th. Now back to Airviews for a second. What's the outlook for the company? How will Airviews evolve as the industry grows? Everyone here at Airviews hopes that throughout the next 12 months and our future beyond that is kind of in the same trajectory that we've seen where we're gaining more content creators and we're exponentially growing the amount of people who are interested in consuming aerial content. It hasn't been easy, but it's also been pretty incredible to see the amount of growth we've had. We kind of think that if we focus on the content creators and then the people who are viewing their videos, that everything else we need to do as a business will kind of fall into place. And my final question, what do you hope people walk away with after using a service? I hope first and foremost, anyone who visits Airviews or uploads to Airviews or becomes a part of the community knows that at our core, our number one value is building that community. Our founder started the company because he loves watching aerial videos and he had a hard time finding them. It is 100% about aiding discovery for aerial content. So everything we're doing, we're always keeping in mind, like, how does this benefit the content creator? How does this benefit someone who's watching? And, you know, I hope that they see that whenever they come to the site or see what we're posting on social media about aerial media that's being created. That's it for episode 140 of the Drone Radio Show. I hope you enjoyed hearing from Megan Gaffney and Tyler Mason of Airviews and learning what makes a compelling drone video. I want to thank Megan and Tyler for taking the time to speak with me. If you want to learn more about Airviews or want to connect with Megan and Tyler, check out the webpage at airviews.com. If you like the Drone Radio Show, please consider supporting the podcast with a small donation. The content is always free, but for as little as $1 per month, you can help defray the cost of production. To donate, Go to patreon.com slash drone radio show. Thanks for listening. Your support means a lot to me, and I hope you'll listen to more episodes of the Drone Radio Show podcast to hear how others are using drones for business, fun, and research. For the Drone Radio Show, I'm Randy Gores. This has been the Drone Radio Show podcast. More information on today's show can be found on our website at www.droneradioshow.com. If you're using drone technology for business, fun, or research, and would like to share your experience on the show, please visit our website and fill out a guest appearance application. 
And don't forget to follow us on your favorite social media channels.